Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Amen. Boy, I tell you what, I'm getting comfortable. I just soon listen to them sing a little while longer. Amen. Now, yeah, now you think you got to listen to me. It's so, uh, but I appreciate that. That's some good singing and uh, blessed our hearts tonight. We're thankful for that. And uh, you even picked up a couple on that other song. We're thankful for that. So, uh, but we appreciate it. And you did a great job. And always do it to glorify God. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, if you'll turn with me once again to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 9. As we look at this passage tonight, as remember chapters 9 through 11, really what we might say parenthetical. It's a part that Paul's talking about, uh, the nation of Israel. And uh, some of these passages are a little difficult to interpret, a little difficult to look at, because in it all, God's, it's talking about God's sovereignty, God's uh, mercy. He dispenses his mercy as he so chooses. And uh, we're seeing here where God is not set aside or he's not forgot about Israel. He's, of course, the nation of Israel kind of put to the side, God calling out church age at this time. But we see at the end, the tribulation period, the millennial kingdom and so forth, there's much of an emphasis on the nation of Israel. And I think we even see that in our passage tonight. But God's calling out a people unto himself. Uh, mostly today, it's, I guess we would say the majority of Gentiles that are being called into the church. They're also Jews. But uh, I think Paul shows that Israel overall in general has rejected her Messiah. Uh, they're looking for that Messiah. But one day, I believe a great many Jews will be turning to Christ and accepting Christ as Savior during that uh, tribulation time and into the millennial kingdom. But we see tonight as we begin in chapter 9, uh, we saw where Paul had a great burden, a great desire to see his Jewish brothers and sisters saved. You know, some could take Paul and they could say, well, Paul's a traitor or he's a heretic or he's abandoned us. Paul had been a Jew, he grew up a Jew, he was a very faithful Jew, very zealous Jew, but Paul knew that he was pursuing the right thing in the wrong way. He knew he was trying to attain his own a righteousness of his own, a self-righteousness. If he could just keep the law, if he could just do this and do this and do this and not do that, then somehow God would have to accept him and he could attain his righteousness, he could earn his own righteousness, he could earn his own salvation. And then he learned that he, didn't, he couldn't do that. Of course, he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, and his life changed for the better. And so Paul knew from experience, and that's why I believe you see uh, such a heartfelt, sincere desire that Paul has for his Jewish brothers and sisters, because he knew the situation they were in. He had once been there, and he knew that the law couldn't save him. He knew by keeping a law, by keeping this, or a rule, or whatever, it couldn't save a person. It was only through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Paul knew also that when he went to many Jews, he would begin many of his messages and many of his missionary tours, he would begin in the synagogue and he would go to the Jews. And he would preach to the Jews, but he saw that the majority that were coming to Christ were Gentiles. And I think we see that even today. Uh, and, and he knew that many of them were coming, but he still had that heart's desire and that burden. Even when we get into chapter 10, we see that. And he began in chapter 9 as he said, you know what, I, I would do anything, I would take anything, I would give up anything to see my Jewish brothers and sisters come to know Christ as Savior. Uh, they're being blinded. And, uh, and we received a night that Jesus Christ, I think, became a stumbling block to them because he got in their way. They wanted to keep the law. They wanted to earn their righteousness. And here's Jesus saying, well, you come into me and you, 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 can, you can be saved. You simple faith in me. And so it was a stumbling block to them. And so Paul gives in chapter 9, he gives privileges of the Israelites. He talks about in verses 4 and 5 where they pertain to the adoption, the glory, the covenants they had, the giving of the law, they had the law, they had the service of God, the tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, the promises, not only the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also the messianic promises. And he says in verse 5, uh, whose are the fathers, the great patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. And so he's talking about that Christ was born a Jew. And so the Jews had every opportunity to accept Christ. They had the privileges. And remember, privilege creates responsibility. When you have uh, the privilege here and you hear the gospel, then you have a responsibility to respond to that gospel. You are accountable to that. And so Paul is listing that. In, and I can just think of Paul writing this chapter here. And, and he's in tears and his heart is broken. But at the same time, he's talking about God's sovereignty because he's talking about you know, God's not through with Israel because God has chosen. And he goes back and gives some prehistory. He says, God has chosen Isaac instead of Ishmael. He's chosen Jacob instead of Esau. He's chosen to bless Moses and to harden Pharaoh. And God has a right to do that because God is sovereign. God is in control. He, can, he has the right, the power, the authority, the freedom 
to do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it. He doesn't have to answer to us. He doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need our suggestions. And he can do what he wants to do. But as we look at this, we don't need to have a problem with God's sovereignty because everything God does is fair, it's just, it's good, it's perfect, it's right. He never does anything unfair, unjust, unkind, unrighteous. So we have to realize that the problem we have sometimes with God's sovereignty, it's man's pride and arrogance. We want to be in control. We want to determine our own destiny. We don't want to be accountable to a God. We don't want to be uh, responsible to a God. And we want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, and how we want to do it. We don't want to have to answer to God. But that's not the way it works in this world. God created us. He formed us from the dust of the ground, Adam, and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul, a living being. And so our very existence depends upon God. Our very physical existence and our spiritual existence uh, depends upon God. And so we need to honor him and praise him and glorify his name. And, and so Paul is, is talking around here about God's sovereignty, but at the same time he's talking about Israel in particular here because he says, you know, God hasn't just uh, put Israel aside. Even though they've rejected Christ on a whole, God is still calling out people to himself, Israelites, Jews, and Gentiles. And, of course, tonight Paul begins to talk about, he gets into a couple of Old Testament passages in the book of Hosea and in the book of Isaiah. But he talks about, as was mentioned a while ago, uh, God is the potter, we are the clay. God shapes us and molds us and forms us. Instead of us trying to make God in our image, God has made us in his image. And so we need to realize that. We need to acknowledge that. We need to uh, share that with others. And we need to realize that uh, God is the one in control and we're not. But you know what? As I mentioned this morning, we have a little trouble. Uh, it bothers us. It disturbs us sometimes to think of that. We have a little tr trouble wrapping our little minds around that, that uh, I must answer to God. And you know what, folks? One day you're going to answer to God whether you like it or not. Do you know that? There comes a day of reckoning, a day of accountability, a day of judgment. Now, Praise God for those of us who are saved. Uh, it's not dealing with our sins. Praise God those are taken care of. Amen. At the cross, they're nailed to the cross forever. For, you know, they're away from us. We never have to, they're not going to be brought up. But for those who are lost, they'll face what the Bible calls in the book of Revelation, the great white throne judgment and be judged according to their works. So you're not going to escape one way or the other, okay? But if you're a Christian, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ uh, for rewards of what, You've done with your gifts, your talents, your abilities. It'll have nothing to do with your sin. You're safe and secure in the loving arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great to know tonight that if you're saved, you're safe and secure. But if you're here tonight and you're lost, then you need to worry a little bit, okay? You need to have that on your mind and you need to think about that sometimes. Because we see here, even in our passage tonight, God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. But God is also a God of judgment. He is a just God. Because he has to be. He has to judge sin. Because, you know, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and he has to judge that sin. He judged it then, and he'll judge it now, and he'll judge it in the future there. Because if not, he would no longer be a holy God. You can't get by with your sin. You can't make excuses for your sin. You can't try to cover that sin. You know, Adam and Eve, we, we saw in Sunday school this morning, they sinned, and they tried to make themselves uh, aprons of fig leaves. They tried to do it themselves. That was man's works. That's man's efforts to try to cover their sin and to try to do that. Of course, later we know that God uh, gave them coats of skin, so blood was shed, and so that's the sacrifice. That's the atonement right there that blood had to cover that, and we see that throughout the Bible, even beginning in the book of Genesis. You say, well, what does that have to do with the book of Romans? Well, the way I take it, the way I've learned it throughout the years, the Bible's connected. Did you know that? Romans goes with Genesis, and Genesis goes with Acts, and Acts goes with... All the Bible's connected right there because there's a common thread running through the Bible, and that's the precious blood of Jesus Christ going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, known as the first gospel right there. Now begin reading with me tonight, verse 25, and we'll read down through verse 33. As we continue to look here not only at God's sovereignty, not only at God dealing with the nation of Israel, but also God calling many Gentiles to himself, and we're going to see that uh, the Jews saw Jesus, he was a stumbling block to them. He, he got in their way. But what we see tonight is pursuing the right thing in the wrong way. Verse 25, as he saith also in Hosea, or that's Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. 
For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom, or Sodom, had <coughs> been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or why? Why haven't they done that? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Well, that's a good passage, isn't it? I just hope I can do it uh, some justice tonight. But if you notice there in verse 25, now, when you notice many times in Scripture, just a little side point here, you'll see names in, in the New Testament of Old Testament prophets, and they're, they're not spelled the way we know they're spelled, because you see Hosi, and they see Isaiah, uh, that's Isaiah. And the reason being, in Greek, uh, there's no H, and there's no, uh, there's, there, there's certain letters there, there's no I, there's no H in Greek, so that's why it comes over this way, and this is how it's interpreted right here. So, it's not talking about a different person, and and I, I'm not talking about a different person, but it's talking about Hosea. Now, you remember the story of Hosea? Hosea was to marry Gomer, this wife who was an adulteress, and she, uh, they had these children. And God was teaching a lesson there in the book of Hosea. And, and, and the first two children, or the second and third child, there was a child named, a daughter named Lo Ruhama, which means no mercy, not mercy. And then there was Lo Ammi, which means not my people. And so that's what Hosea was to name his second and third children. First child was Jezreel, but... The thing about that is God was dealing with the nation of Israel and Hosea. And Paul takes that here in the book of Romans and not only applying that to the nation of Israel, but he's applying that to Gentiles. And you say, well, I didn't think we were supposed to add to the word of God or take away from the word of God or reinterpret the word of God. Paul's not doing that. Who led Hosea to write what he did? The Holy Spirit of God. Who's leading Paul to write what Paul did? The Holy Spirit of God. Now, we're not to do that today. Well, the canon of scriptures closed, but Paul not only applies this, but he's applying this also to Gentiles and showing that it shouldn't surprise the Israelites that Gentiles are being called to salvation. Because if you look there, he says, also he says in Osi or Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And he's talking about, you know, Israel went into captivity and they were in exile and they were away from God, and, and God temporarily, we might say, rejected them as they went into captivity but God said they'll be there a certain amount of years 70 years and then they'll come back and and they'll be my people as long as they repent of their sins and confess their sins and come back to me and all these different things like that and so Hosea was called to write that and he was also to play that out within his life in marrying this woman uh, an adulteress and, and that's what Israel had done spiritual adultery against God God was the one they should have been uh, clinging to and holding to but they'd gone after other gods they had gone whoring, so to speak, the Bible talks about, after other gods, and they had left the true God, and, and so they committed adultery, really, against the Almighty God. But you know what? It, it says here, and what Paul's saying is, they were not my people, but one day they're going to be my people again. And you know, if you just read anything about the nation of Israel today, you know anything about the history of the nation of Israel, there's a lot of Israelites today, uh, the majority of them have rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, there are a few, as Paul talks here, there are a few that have come to faith in Christ. They're known as Messianic Jews or Jewish Christians that have come to faith in Christ. But in general, the majority of the nation of Israel, they have rejected their Messiah. And Paul mentions they had the privileges. Privileges count. Uh, it, it means responsibility here. They were the ones who had the law. They were the ones who had the ordinances. They were the ones who had the priesthood. They're the ones who had all these things. The great prophets that wrote the Bible, yet they've rejected their Messiah. But Paul says there comes a day, I believe, and of course John mentions it in the book of the Revelation, that many of the Jews will have a great turning to Christ. We see in the book of the Revelation 144,000 Jewish evangelists sealed uh, there during the tribulation period proclaiming the gospel. And I think many people coming to Christ. But it's going to be a terrible time. Why wait for that? If you're saved today and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, I don't believe the church is going to go through that tribulation period. We're going to be taken out. And those are going to be left here without Christ. So... Get your heart right with God today, amen? Make sure you know Christ today as your Savior. And so Paul goes back and he's talking about that God is going to show mercy also to the Gentiles. He's still showing mercy to Israel because you know what? He hadn't destroyed Israel, has he? Israel's still a nation over the there today. 
Even though, even though many nations want to destroy Israel, want to wipe Israel off the face of the map, I don't think that's going to take place because if it does, then we can take the book of the Revelation really from chapter 3 on and throw it out the window because it makes no sense because it's, uh, it's focusing and concerning that nation of Israel at that particular place in history and, and that particular geographical location there in the Middle East. And so if, if for some reason Iran or whatever comes by and they wipe out Israel and they say, hey, something's going on here, this Bible's not right. But you can mark it down, you can take it to the bank, that's not going to take place. I don't care who says we're going to wipe Israel off, they're not going to do that, okay? Because of the apple of God's eye, they're God's chosen earthly people, and God still has a plan for them. You know, some of these covenants and so forth, uh, many of these things have been fulfilled, but they're going to be fulfilled later uh, during that tribulation millennial kingdom that what God has started, God is going to finish. God is able, God can, and God will do those things. And so we have to sit back and watch and wait and watch God do those things. Of course, I think as believers, we'll be doing that from the balcony in heaven. Amen. Verse 26, it shall come to pass in the place where it was that said unto them, you're not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And so not only, I think, applying to the nation of Israel, but also Gentiles, where they didn't have the law, they, they didn't uh, have all the priesthood and the temple and the tabernacle and all these different things, yet God is calling them his people. And, you know, Paul mentions many times, especially in the book of Galatians, he talks about uh, Jew and Gentile are one in Christ. You know, we're, most of us in here today, we weren't born as Jews. We are born as Gentiles. But if by faith in Jesus Christ, we are all brothers and sisters in the Lord. It doesn't matter if you're, you're born a Jew, a Gentile, black or white, rich, poor, male, female, it doesn't matter. We are all one family, the family of God, by faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And we're all going to be in heaven together one day. Isn't that wonderful? You say, well, I don't want to be in heaven with that person. Well, too bad you're going to be, okay? So get along now. But Paul mentions this here. He gives a little quote, a couple of verses here from the book of Hosea just talking about where God is still dealing with Israel, and God is also calling the Gentiles. And then he goes into verse 27, and he talks about Isaiah. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. You know, when you look at these Old Testament passages and the New Testament writers write about this, sometimes you have what we might say a double reference. The Old Testament's talking about, in the immediate context, this story, but it also applies to something else. You see that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 enmity between the, the serpent seed, between Satan's seed, and between the woman's seed. Now that has an immediate context there, but it also has further, immediate, further context or further description there, further meaning there, talking about the gospel. So you see this many times in scripture. And so Isaiah also concer cries concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. <clears throat> now let's look at that for just a moment. We see here, remember God gave the promise to Abraham and he reconfirmed it to Isaac and to Jacob and he said, Abraham, you're going to have a land, you're going to have a seed, you're going to be a blessing to the world. And he said, you, you, your descendants are going to be what? As numerous as the sand on the sea, as the stars of heaven. So you see a little bit of that in this passage right here talking about Abraham's physical or natural prosperity, talking about uh, his posterity, talking about the, the natural children of Abraham. But he goes on to say, a remnant shall be saved. Not all Israel are true Israel. Paul's already talked about that. It's those who have faith in Christ. And you know, I think of this today. It says the, the number of the sand of the sea. You think of the millions of people in our world today. What is there somewhere around... Six billion people or something on, on planet Earth today. But you know what? There's a very small percentage that are Christian people. Did you know that? Jesus talks about narrow is the way, narrow is the gate. And you know, the, the broad is way, and there's going to be few that find that narrow way. So it's not talking about everyone's going to be saved. Sadly, today, I was looking at the newspaper, and they had a, they had a uh, survey. And of all places, it was Harvard, so you can take that for what it is. But it was talking about the incoming freshmen. And it was talking about, I think it was 30, close to 38% of incoming freshmen at, at Harvard University in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 38% were either atheist or agnostic. And it talked about the percentage of Protestants and Catholic were very few. Protestants were like 17%, Catholic maybe 17, 18%. So it's a very low number right there. And each generation, it seems like it's getting lower and lower and lower. And you can take that. It might be skewed a little bit for Harvard, but the thing about it, I, I, I think it's a high number today of many freshmen entering college 
They have no religious affiliation. They have no faith in Jesus Christ. You know, I sat in classes in college years ago, and you have to listen to someone talking about, you know, the earth billions and billions of years ago and the evolution and all this. And, and I thought, you know what, I know better because I was taken to church and I learned about these things. But a lot of these kids come in there. They've never been in church. They've never heard the word of God. They've never heard anything about creation. And they're sucked into that. They believe that garbage. You know that? And, and that's, their, that's how they view the world. Do you view it from a biblical worldview or a worldly world, uh, worldview? And so I look at things from a biblical worldview. Now, I know you can't teach creation in college, but the thing about it, you need to know something about that. And, and as we go right here, there's a lot of people in the world today. But Paul is saying there's a remnant of Israelites that are going to be saved. They're going to be preserved, not only physically through the tribulation period, but also saved spiritually through that time. And God always has his remnant. You go all the way back to the beginning of time, and God always has his remnant, that minority, that group that it, it, he calls his. You know, Israel was really a minority because we've already looked at that in the book of Deuteronomy that, that Israel was nothing great about Israel. She wasn't a great nation, wasn't a prosperous nation, wasn't anything that stuck out. But God chose Abraham to, to begin this nation, to, to create this nation of Israelites. And Israel was to be a light to the world. They were to be witnesses to the world, and they were to be testimonies to the Lord. They were to share the gospel, but they failed miserably. You know, they, they excluded that, and they kept that to themselves, and, they, and they, they begin pride and arrogance right here. Well, we have the law, and you don't. We have this, and you don't. We have that, and you don't. And, and, and so God, Paul, God has led Paul to turn to the Gentiles. We saw this through the book of Acts, that the gospel is also for the Gentile as well as the Jew. But you just think, even in our world today, there's a lot of people in the United States today that has a lot of privileges today that a lot of people overseas in China or Brazil or in Africa or wherever, <clears throat> they don't have those privileges today. Did you know that? We have churches practically on every corner here in the United States, especially here in the Bible Belt, especially in the state of Kentucky. You can drive up and down this road. You can turn right or left, and I guarantee you're going to run into a church within a mile or two. We have copies of the Word of God. You may have five, six, seven Bibles in your home. We have an opportunity to come to church. We have an opportunity to listen to the gospel being preached on the radio or on television or on the internet. And so we have so many privileges today, but yet many people have rejected Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? Well, their hearts are blinded, whatever, you know, unbelief, whatever. And so that's basically what Paul is saying here. So many privileges, so many thousands of Israelites that could be saved, but they've rejected because of their unbelief. He says in verse 28, he will finish the work, cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. Not only talking salvation terms, but also, you know, I, I, going back to a tribulation period, seven years. That, that's a short time, really, when you, when you compare things. You know, captivity, 70 years. So God's work is short right there, but there's going to come a time, as I mentioned this morning, that God's going to shut the door and God's going to say, enough, there's no more. Uh, you, you can't be saved after you die. You can't make that second choice. The rich man and Lazarus in the book of, La in, in the book of Luke, you see that right there. The rich man, he died. And he cried out from hell, Oh, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send someone to my brothers and, and that they might learn the gospel. They might hear the gospel. You remember what was said? Too late. Door's been closed. There's no second chance. And so there is a remnant that we're going to be saved. God always has a remnant. Verse 29, as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth, that means the Lord of hosts, the armies of heaven, said if he had... It said, except the Lord of Sabaoth had not left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Now, what do you think of when you think of that? Total destruction. Did you know that? And you know what? I, I fear for our nation sometimes today. Did you know that? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, didn't he? Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't think, would hold a light to what we have today in our world. Did you know that? of the sin and the depravity and the debauchery and everything that was taking place in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, I'm going to destroy this town. I'm going to destroy these cities. And God did that. God said, I'm going to do it. And God did that. And you know what? Maybe the United States hasn't been destroyed today because there's a faithful remnant left in this state today. Do you know what? There's a faithful remnant in this nation today. There are good Christian people. There are good godly people taking a stand for the Lord and preaching the gospel and living the gospel and sharing the gospel. And folks, we're not the only ones, okay? I'm thankful there's other churches tonight preaching the gospel, don't you? I'm thankful you go somewhere down the road, there's other good Christian people, not just Emmanuel, but all over this state. There's good, godly people. And there's a remnant here of the United States of America that still believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and still reverence and respect an almighty God. 
But folks, is it getting worse? Is it going down? Is it going down? Is it going down? We've got a lot of work to do. Has the church failed? If we have Christians failed, we have a responsibility, an obligation, a privilege. We have that to share the gospel and to go out and to tell people how great God is and what Jesus Christ can do in their lives. And so what he's saying here, unless the Lord had been merciful, unless the Lord had shown his grace, then says that right here, they would have become as Sodom and Gomorrah. God would completely have wiped them out. You know, I mentioned today about Adam and Eve. They sinned. God could have wiped them out. But a few verses later, God said, you're going to have sorrow and pain in childbearing. What that means? The human race is going to continue. God sent uh, the northern kingdom into Assyrian captivity. He sent the southern kingdom into Babylonian captivity. He warned them, he warned them, he warned them. All the privileges, all the, the great privileges they had, yet they rejected God, they turned against God, they hated God, they rebelled against God, and they went after false gods and idols. God could have said, I'm through with you. I I'm done with you. But God sent them into a punishment, discipline time. Seventy years for the southern kingdom. But you know what? God brought them out of there, didn't he? He brought them out, took them back to the land, didn't he? He did that. He took them into Egyptian bondage. They learned a few lessons there. When they got out, they did the same thing. Is God doing that today? Is God trying to get our attention as a nation, as a country today, that God says, hey, there is judgment coming, and I hope you'll pay attention. Look at verse 30. He says there, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Now, what he means there, he says, look, the Gentiles are included in God's plan of redemption. But the Gentiles weren't looking for righteousness. They weren't looking for God. They weren't looking to be saved. The Gentiles in general, okay, many of these were pagans. They didn't have the law. They didn't have the commandments. They didn't have the prophets. They didn't have anything. So they, they really weren't looking to attain righteousness. They weren't looking for a way of salvation. They didn't know. But they've attained that how? By faith. And I think Paul can use this from a personal experience that, as I mentioned, many places where Paul went, he went to the synagogues, the Jews rejected him. How many times in Scripture do you see? Paul says, I turn to the Gentiles. The Jews reject me, so I turn to the Gentiles. And many of the Gentiles are accepting me. They're accepting this gospel. They're believing this gospel. They're repenting of their sins, and they're being saved by faith. And they're starting churches, and they're, they're opening up churches, and they're, they're doing a work of evangelists. They're, they're doing the things that needs to be done. But here the Jews aren't doing what they need to be doing. They're not always going out and doing what they're going to be doing. And so he says the Gentiles, they didn't really attain this. They didn't really look for this. But they received it because of God's mercy, because of God's marvelous grace, because of God's sovereignty right here. And then he goes here and does a contrast with Israel. Israel, in verse 31, they followed after the law of righteousness. But notice here they have not attained to the law of righteousness. Now what's he saying here? Well, they tried to be righteous. They thought if we can follow this law, and we can follow this rule and this regulation, then God's going to accept me, and God's going to approve of me, and I'm going to go to heaven. And you know the sad thing about that today, folks? This is pursuing the right thing in the wrong way. There's a lot of people today that are pursuing the right thing in the wrong way. Did you know that? A lot of people pursuing the right thing in the wrong way. They say, you know what? I'd like to go to heaven, and I'd like to spend an eternity with this God, and, you know, I've heard there's uh, pearly gates and there's streets of gold. And, boy, I heard it's just wonderful up there. We have wings that we fly around on or, or whatever. And I, that's the place I want to go to. And they say, so I want to get there. But they're trying to get there the wrong way. They're saying, well, I've got to earn my way. I've got to work my way. I deserve my way. I'll be just a good person. I'll join this church and I'll be baptized ten times. And I know without a doubt God has to accept me. Folks, let me tell you the truth right here. None of those things are going to get you to heaven, okay? Except faith in Jesus Christ, period. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's only one way. And, and you say, well, that's awful narrow. As I always say, I thank God that at least there's one way, don't you? See, God could have destroyed us the minute we sinned. God could have got rid of us, got rid of this nation. And, you know, I just pondered sometimes why God still puts up with this nation. Did you know that? I just wonder sometimes. God's mercy, God's grace, God's long-suffering, patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. But you know what? There's a good godly remnant still in the United States of America, and I hope it stays that way. But what he says here, he says Israel tried to attain righteousness, but they went about it the wrong way. Because in verse 32, he says, wherefore or why? He gives, he gives the reason here. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. See, it trips them up. 
They, they want to try to do that. And you see, man has a problem sometimes with receiving a free gift of grace by faith in Christ. Because we've always been taught we need to work for something, don't we? You need to work and study hard and you have good education. You need to work hard and save money and you buy your house one day and you buy your car. You buy your nice Mustang. Amen? All right. But you have to work for it. You have to work hard. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, okay? But we get that so in tune to our minds that when someone gives us something free, what's the first thing we do? Red flag pops up. Someone calls you. Mr. and Miss So-and-so, you want a free cruise to the Bahamas. It's a $20,000 cruise. It's all the meals. We're going to fly you down there. You're going to be two weeks out here, and it's absolutely free. What's the first thing you think of? What's the catch? What do they want me to buy? What do they want me to do? Where do they want me to go? And so we, we, we don't like to take things free because we're, we're so uh, suspect on these things and suspicious because nothing's free in life, we say. We say, well, you, you can't get anything free. But, folks, the gift of salvation is free. It's free. It's, it's already been paid for. So everything in heaven's already been paid for. You know, when you get to heaven, you're not going to have to pull out your credit card and say, well, you know, I'm going to pay for three nights here. You don't have to do that. It's already taken care of. It's like somebody's already paid for that. Christ already paid for that. You, all you have to do is check in. All you have to do is go in there. Everything's prepared for you. There's even a men under the pillow. Did you know that? But it's going to be wonderful. And see, we, we don't have to pay for anything. But that man doesn't really like that. It goes against our pride and our arrogance and our nature because we want to work for that. And we think if we work for it, then we, we deserve it and we earn that. What Paul is saying all along here, that's not the case. It's a free gift. Because look what he says. He says, why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They tried to work for their salvation. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, I want you to turn with me to a couple passages as we begin to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, just a couple of pages over. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. This is also Paul writing to the church at Corinth. But look what Paul says in verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a what? A stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. You see, folks, the cross is very offensive to a lot of people. Did you know that? It's very offensive to a lot of people. Christ died. He shed his blood. He, he, he was buried and he rose again. And somebody did that for me. And that's a stumbling block to a lot. It's foolishness to a lot of people. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Dead person doesn't rise again. Someone can't die for me so that I can live. You remember I talked about when God, you know, the coats of skin that were, were placed on Adam and Eve. God had, God, it, it was the first killing there, the first blood that was shed right there. And, and the blood covers the sin. Without shedding the blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness of sin because the blood represents the life. And so blood had to be shed. And so a lot of people don't like that. They think it's gruesome or barbaric or old-fashioned. They don't like that. And a lot of churches, they sadly, a lot of preachers, sadly, they, they, they shy away from talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. But without the blood of Jesus Christ, we have no redemption. We have no salvation. We have no eternal life. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. Amen? And I don't apologize saying that. I'm glad to say that. I'm proud to say that because that's what saved me was the precious blood of Christ. And if you're saved tonight... Thank God for the blood of Christ. Look with me one last verse. Look over in the book, book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. Peter talks about this also as he quotes from this verse, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 6. It says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not, shall never be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even of them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, this, this place is appointed for them, hell, okay? And so, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. Look at verse 10. Which in time past were not a people. We read that, didn't we? But are now the people of God. 
which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. See, Peter writes the same thing Paul writes right there. Now, if we go back to Romans, the book of Romans chapter 9. You see, folks, Jesus Christ is either your stepping stone or he's your stumbling stone. And you say, well, how can he become a stumbling stone? Well, you see, to Israel, they wanted to keep the law. They wanted the Pharisees, especially, you know, if you know anything in history about the Pharisees, they added a lot of laws to God's laws. And they had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of laws. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. Legalism gets into all that. And so what it was when Christ came along, and Christ said, look, you don't have to follow all those things. And Paul's not saying, don't be obedient to the law. But what he's rejecting here is righteousness by works. Jesus is not saying, I don't want you to follow the law. Thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery. No, you, you keep those, but you do it for the right reason. You don't do it to be saved. You do it because you are saved. And so what Israel did, Israel's stumbling block was Jesus because they thought, hey, you know, he doesn't fit our mold as the Messiah. He's not what we expect as a Messiah. And so they wanted to attain this law and earn their own righteousness and earn their own salvation, earn their own approval with God. And when Jesus came along and said, hey, you don't have to do that to gain salvation. You just place your faith and trust in me, in my death, burial, and resurrection, and you can be saved. And you see what happened. Jesus got in their way. And you know what? A lot of people today, Jesus gets in their way. Because Jesus said, you need to change your life. You need to repent of your sins. You, you, you need to turn over a new leaf. And, and you need to start living for me. And you need to quit trying to gain righteousness and salvation by, by being a good person or doing good works. Those are all fine and dandy if you have them in the right priority and order. But he says, if you want to be saved, you can't put me aside. And you can't step all over me. You have to believe in me because if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be saved. But you see, it gets in the way for a lot of people today. But folks, I'm telling you today, as Paul writes here, and we're going to see in chapter 10, that great chapter in Romans. You know, many times we think of evangelistic work, the Roman road. Well, we're going to see that in chapter 10. You know, and it ends there with, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Paul's saying, look, the gospel is for Gentiles, the gospel is for Jew, the gospel is for everyone. And he says in chapter 10 and verse 1, he says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That, that, that's my burden. That's why he's talking about this, because he's showing God's sovereignty. God, God isn't through with Israel. God isn't through with the Gentiles. He's calling a people to himself, and it's all because of God's great grace and his great mercy. Aren't you thankful for night? For that amazing grace of God. Aren't you thankful tonight for God's great mercy? For God's great compassion and God's great love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I hope you know that verse. I hope you believe that verse. And I hope that verse is in your heart tonight. And I hope you've accepted this Christ who was crucified at Calvary that we might have eternal life. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for our passage of Scripture tonight. And, Lord, we thank you for the words of the great prophet Hosea and Isaiah. And as Paul takes these and applies these not only to the lives of the Israelites but also to our lives. And we thank you tonight, Lord, that we can come as a, that we do have freedoms to come in this nation to worship you and the right to assemble here. And, Father, we're thankful tonight for everyone that's here. We're thankful, Lord, for those in the past that have taught us and trained us and discipled us. And, Lord, we now have a responsibility to do that to the next generation and help us to do that because we see statistics coming out, Lord, that so many people are turning away from you, turning away from Christ, and the world just seems to be getting more secular all the time. Atheists and agnostics and secular humanism and all these different things, Lord, help us, Lord, to never get down but know that we have work to do. As Paul is writing this, and he knew as he wrote this, he had work to do. He knew there were a lot of people who needed to be saved, and he was burdened over those Jewish brothers and sisters of his. And Lord, give us that burden to go out and to share Christ and invite people to church. And Lord, that this, might, this church might be a shining light, not only in this community, in this state, but in this nation around this world. Father, we pray for our time of invitation tonight. If there's one here without Christ, they've heard the gospel tonight, I pray you'll touch their hearts. They would come forward publicly professing Christ as Savior. There may be other needs here tonight. Father, we give this time to you. We thank you for all you do for us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We stand with me tonight. What number, Bill? 167. 167. Number 167, you sing tonight. God speaks to your heart. May you come, and may God bless you.